This is Thursday, July 17, 2014. We are in the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the continuing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Mass. My name is Maureen Sullivan, and we are privileged to have with us today Charles R. Rogers. Welcome, Charlie. Hello. May I ask when you were born? I was born in, uh, no, on November 7, 1919. Uh, and where were you born? I was born in Geneva, New York. What community do you currently live in? Marlboro, Massachusetts. Your marital status? Uh, my uh, wife and I were married for 69 years. She passed away uh, two years ago. Do you have children? Yes, I do. I had, I had five children. And how many grandchildren? Uh, <laughs> seven. Do you have great-grandchildren? I have three great-grandchildren. Tell us what Geneva, New York was like growing up. Geneva, New York uh, is situated on the north end of Seneca Lake, one of the famous Finger Lakes of New York State. And uh, <clears throat> uh, when I was growing up, there was many things that were exciting there. They used to have on the lake uh, a speedboat race, one that the motors would drive you crazy because they were so loud and close to the shore. They had to stop that uh, because our lake, uh, when the wind came up, uh, got, got so uh, rough that uh, it wasn't conducive for racing and they had to move it. But it was a good one when we were growing up. Charlie, tell us a little bit about your family. What did your mother and father do for a living? My father was an insurance salesman. He had a general agency in uh, downtown Geneva. He also was mayor of the city on three different terms. Interesting. He loved people. <laughs> and my wife, or my mother, was uh, a nice little lady that grew up in a farm area of northern Pennsylvania. And God bless her, she was very good for my brother, sister, and my son. I was just about to ask you about your siblings. Uh, I, I, uh, I understand before the interview, you were telling us a bit about your brother during the war. What did he do? My brother was, uh, before the war started, he was going to Hobart College, and he was a member of the uh, ROTC. It was the Marine Corps ROTC. And so when uh, the war started, he was called in uh, as a second lieutenant, and uh, he served in the South Pacific and all the islands, starting with Guadalcanal. He rose to be a captain and uh, was wounded, of course, down there. And he's mentioned in the book about Tarawa five different times. And what was your brother's name? My brother's name was Robert Harding Rogers, named after President Harding. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, let's get back to life in Geneva, New York, of course. Your child, part of your childhood was the Great Depression. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> well, we went through a Great Depression because, uh, about, uh, because my brother, my family, and I all accepted things as they were. We did not complain. <clears throat> we always had food on the table. Uh, that's about all I can tell you about the Depression. If it was a housewife, they'd tell you you could buy Hamburg for five cents a pound. <laughs> 
high school? Yes, I did. And what high school did you go to? Geneva High School. And did you graduate? I graduated, yes, I did, in 1938. During the time you were in high school, were you and your classmates made aware of events in Europe and Asia? Yes, I suppose so, but uh, uh, we, uh, we were, uh, I think, uh, more interested in uh, our studies and our sports and uh, the current uh, things that we did. And so I don't think that um, uh, the rest of the people, young people that were growing up with me and around me, we did not uh, follow uh, the, the world events uh, that way. Uh, and of course, that didn't get really hot over there until after we had graduated from high school. And let's get to that. What did you do after high school? <clears throat> I uh, was an artist from the time I was young. I loved to draw, and uh, uh, <laughs> the teachers weren't happy when I would be drawing characterizations of my fellow uh, classmates. <clears throat> uh, but I went to art school in Rochester, New York. I went to RIT before it was called that mm -hmm. and uh, graduated from the art school before I went in the service. Does that answer your question? I ended up uh, uh, as a commercial artist, yes. And when did you graduate from RIT? Or be, were well, it would have been, uh, it would have been, uh, January, it would have been the early in, uh, see, I can't remember whether it was 41 or 42. Okay. Well, let's remember one event from 1941. What, what were you doing when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Well, I remember when I first heard about it. I used to bum home, uh, I assume people know what that meant, uh, from a, a school on a, because I worked my way through school also. And I would bum my way home on a Sunday. Uh, we were about 45 miles away. And uh, when I walked into the door on Sunday afternoon, my father told me that about Pearl Harbor. Were you aware what Pearl Harbor was? Well, of course, he, uh, he had, uh, gave me uh, the most of the important details, but I knew about Pearl Harbor uh, and I knew about the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist or were you... Uh, okay. The next thing that happened was my mind uh, immediately thought, I'll have to get, get in. Mm -hmm. And so on the way back home, or back to school, I was making plans in my mind as to what I would do and how to do it. I knew that you the, the recruiting was in... Uh, uh, Rochester, downtown Rochester in the Armory. And so the first chance I got after I got back to Rochester on a Monday uh, or Tuesday, I uh, went and signed up. And what service did you sign up for? <laughs> I tried to sign up for the the Marines first, it wouldn't take me because I was too short for my age. Uh, well, I had no more growth, see. And, and so I went to the Navy, and the Navy did the same thing. So uh, I felt the, the only choice I've got is the Army, and I went and signed up with, in the Army unassigned. Okay. Tell us what happened next. Well, uh, they told me that uh, I would be ready to, had to be ready to leave by train. Uh, 
probably uh, one week later or two, I can't remember that. Uh, and uh, so I uh, was there to sign up and uh, the group that I was in uh, was a very small group. Uh, I wondered if I made the right choice because there were uh, five farm boys, uh, two of them were holding hands, two brothers. <laughs> And, and they were the only ones. The rest of these young fellows that I saw, and not some of them were even in the, the RIT with me, uh, they all signed up for the Air Corps uh, ground crew. Okay. And uh, I thought, oh boy, <laughs> I didn't guess right. But it worked out fine. Okay. So where were you sent for basic? I was sent to Long Island, right the end of Long Island. Uh, was Camp Upton at Yap Hank, uh, Long Island, and uh, then I was there a week, and uh, because one of these farm boys had uh, was not that young, he'd been a sergeant uh, in the service before, and he came out, and uh, so he and I, uh, he got me to go with him to uh, a group that were going to basic training in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. But you were still in Long Island, right? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, tell us what basic was like. Oh, basic training and, uh, well, again, I got an unusual situation because instead of the normal one uh, for artillery, which would have been a, a, a 105 millimeter guns that were used, they had one 240 millimeter gun that had to be put in with big steel structures around it. Uh, a, a deep hole had to be dug first and then there were uh, steel uh, corners that were put in uh, to hold it and once it was all in there then a crane came in and put this huge cannon in the ground. And when it went off, it shook the ground. Uh, of course, uh, they didn't have many of those, uh, I, I'm sure, during the war, but that's what I, I trained on. Okay. Uh, did, what did you like about BASIC? I liked it about BASIC uh, because uh, we did a lot of manual things, uh, marching, learned how to march. Uh, we, we had uh, all kinds of competition. And then uh, classes and uh, the different guns uh, that we uh, might be uh, firing and uh, how to take them apart in, in the dark and so forth. And uh, apparently I, uh, made an impression on some of these people because they, when they came up with uh, that whole group of uh, recruits, I was number two on the list to go to OCS uh, at Fort Sill, Oklahoma to become a second lieutenant. So now you're heading to Fort Sill. Is this the first time you have been away from New York? Yes. But they gave me uh, uh, a leave uh, during uh, the transit. So I was able to go home for uh, five days on my way uh, to uh, Fort Sill. Okay. So now you're in officer's candidate school in the middle of the country. Tell us what that was like. Well, again, that was fun, I thought. Uh, we did so many things different, and we had to do everything as right as possible. First thing in the morning, we had what was called hog calling. We were lined up in front of our uh, little uh, wooden cabins, and uh, then uh, we had to uh, learn how to uh, issue uh, commands starting in the, our ch deep in our chest and project up and out and be able to be just like I'm doing now, only louder. <laughs> so you weren't on a hill yelling 
spelling suey suey. No. All right. How long uh, were you in Ops's candidate school? Three months. And it was very interesting, uh, Maureen. Uh, I found that all the schools that I went through in, uh, in the Army, they ran them uh, quite rapidly and demanded uh, the top of whatever you could produce. And only about 50% would graduate. But you were one of the I was one of the ones that graduated. So now you are a... I was a second lieutenant mm -hmm. in the field artillery. Tell us what happened next. <laughs> well, there was a camp in northern part of New York State, and at that time it was called Pine Camp. It was up near Watertown, New York. And so I put a request for that, and by golly, I got it. So I was assigned to the 4th Armored Division in Pine Camp. And during the war, I think, Everybody remembers that was General Patton's lead division. And I lost many friends that I made there in the year and a half that I was in that, that uh, Fourth Armor Division. What year was it when you arrived in Pine Camp? Was it now 1942, 43? Oh, yes, that was uh, in uh, the end of uh, July. Of uh, 42. 42, okay. And how long were you uh, at the camp? I was there until an, uh, early November <clears throat> where we went on maneuvers uh, in uh, Tennessee. And what were your duties as a second lieutenant? Well, I had a number of them. I was originally assigned to the service battery of uh, the 22nd Field Artillery Battalion. And uh, I was assistant uh, S4. That meant uh, I was uh, an assistant to the captain in charge of service battery who handled the supplies for that uh, 22nd Field Artillery Battalion. But then I was, uh, at a, another time, I wanted to be involved in the shooting of the guns. So I was made a forward observer and learned how to uh, shoot, uh, direct the guns to, to shoot on target. I'll skip now uh, to, uh, an incident that I think is important uh, to tell, I think it's going to actuate, uh, accentuate my luck that I've, I had in the air over the front during my uh, artillery pilot uh, work. I was in charge <coughs> of the ammunition train had 10 half tracks that were assigned to go and bring uh, the shells, the armor, uh, the artillery shells loaded. And we would have benches on the side. They were like a half track, just like a tank in a way, only they had uh, wheels on the front and then the half track, the trap was in the back. And uh, the steel that they were made of was, uh, far thicker than a quarter of an inch. I don't know, it might have been three-eighths. Uh, but anyway, uh, we, were, uh, we would start at the bottom or the top of the state, I can't remember. And then during the, uh, the day, uh, we would uh, be in column going uh, up uh, these uh, country roads. At one point, we were on what used to be the bed of a railroad uh, tr track. They'd taken the, the uh, ties and uh, the, everything off of it, 
but uh, as you would know and remember, uh, the base of that, uh, as that would raise high, where it went over some uh, high areas, uh, was very soft and, and shale. And during that uh, period, uh, my battery commander came along, sighed, and he said, Buck, hop in with me and help me uh, check the column. Put Lieutenant Weissman in charge. And Lieutenant Weissman had only been with us for one month. He was a nice young guy from New York City. 10 to 15 minutes later, there was a tank, a light tank that was coming back with our forward observer in it to get something fixed. It was so narrow the road was that the half tracks, when he came by, started to pull off to the right. And because must have been three of them, got too far over. They cascaded down 40 feet, and that half track fell on top of them. They killed six of them. One of them was my half track, and Lieutenant Wiseman was killed. So I was lucky. I'll say you were. Now, did this take place in Tennessee? Yes. Or in no, no, Tennessee. Subsequently, we went and, and maneuvered in uh, the Mojave Desert all winter. What was that like? Well, that was different because you had sandstorms that came up. You couldn't see. You could hardly breathe. Uh, but what more can I tell you about the Mojave Desert? Uh, it was very hot. Of course, it was dry. <clears throat> and. Uh, I came home from the Mojave Desert for uh, five days uh, leave to get married. And that would have been uh, in 1943. That was uh, May 17 that we got married. You want me to continue after that? Well, uh, of course, then I went back out to the desert, joined uh, the 4th Armored, and uh, while we were out there, I uh, saw a notice on the bulletin board that they were looking for artillery pilots, or uh, art, uh, artillery officers, to learn how to fly little Piper Cubs and become artillery spotter pilots. Uh -huh. And so I signed up and I was selected uh, and subsequently I went uh, to uh, Pittsburgh, Kansas and learned how to fly. That was another three months thing and 50% of the class failed. Uh, from there we went to Fort Sill and uh, we were there for uh, about uh, one month, and we learned how to fly little Piper Cubs uh, the way you're not supposed to do. We learned how to, la how to take off, land and take off from very, very small fields, learned how to land on uh, country roads, and even on S-type roads where we had to rock from one wheel to another as we went around the corner. Uh, we we uh, learned how to they put ponton, pontons on the, instead of wheels, we learned how to fly, to landing and taking off of water. We had to f fly at night and uh, learn how to navigate at night. And then we had cross country flights where we had to be down right on the terrain, just above the terrain, hopping over telephone poles and trees and things like that going in a triangle pattern, but that's very hard to navigate because when you're way up high, you can look down and see road networks and us. But when you're flying right on the ground, that's another thing that's very hard to do, and you have to learn how to do it. You're saying flying on the ground. How 
far above the ground were you really? Uh, I would say anywhere from uh, 10, 10 feet uh, to uh, 25 feet. Or over the trees, however high they were. All right. And I believe you have a photo of you with the Piper Cub. If you'd be so kind as to dig it out. Oh, you mean this one? Yeah. And that is you with your, this is your Piper Cub. Now, yeah, but this, yes, this is uh, after we were over in France mm -hmm. or Germany. Just wanted to give folks an idea of what a Piper Cub looks like. I can get the can the bigger one here. Yeah, if you would, please. And that is a Piper Cub. Yes, a Piper Cub. And that's what you learned to fly. Now, would there be anyone else besides you in the Cub? Yes, uh, there would be an observer. And he was the one that had a radio behind him, and uh, he was the one that actually called the, the and directed the fire onto and uh, to the target so that uh, we could uh, eliminate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you through with this? Thank you, Charlie. All right. Now we're going to have to go Next. Well, of course, uh, at that time, then uh, when we were, I was uh, assigned to uh, a special uh, artillery uh, group. I, I can't remember what it was called, but it was a, a, a ta It would be attached to any division that wanted to have uh, the larger guns attached to it. Uh, they would have been the 155 millimeter guns, and it was in Camp Croft, South Carolina. I was there for about two months, and then I found out uh, that I was being rushed to Europe uh, as a replacement pilot. So uh, from there, I went uh, to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and stayed a week uh, at uh, the camp outside Washington, D.C. I forgot the name of it now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's Meade, Camp Meade. But anyway, uh, from there I was uh, sent to and trucked to with some others uh, to Massachusetts and Boston Harbor, and they loaded us on the Aquitania. Uh, to go to France, and that was the second largest ship in the world at that time. You want me to continue? Well, let's talk a little bit about your trip to France on the Aquitania. Uh, were you a part of a convoy? Uh, yes, uh, our ship was a uh, part of a convoy. And how long did it take for the convoy to get to France? Five days. That's pretty quick. And what did you do while you're on the Aquitania? Well, <laughs> I forgot. Uh, I think I, you don't want to hear this. I went to the rail a couple of times. Don't <laughs> uh, be ashamed. <laughs> and, uh, but then anyway, uh, we had, uh, the officers had to have assigned uh, the times to go down into the hold where the men were. The men were down in the hold of the ship, and we had assigned uh, cabins uh, with, uh, there would be six of us in a cabin, in hammocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the way we went over. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, you want me to now say where we landed? And so Go right ahead. All right. Our ship. Uh, landed uh, into the Firth of Clyde, and uh, there were two little towns right next to uh, One was uh, Doric and the other was Gorick. Mm -hmm. I can't remember which one, but they were right close together. 
And so uh, our ship went in there in the center of the, of the Firth, the, the Clyde, and there was a tender came out and we had to climb over board and go down rope ladders uh, into a little small uh, tenders and they took us into the harbor and it was about 5.30, 6 o'clock at night. And uh, there was a train backed up onto the piers. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, they, we loaded right on the train. And uh, then uh, when the train was full, uh, they took us in blackout through Scotland and England to, the, uh, to Southampton. If you'll pardon me, I'm going to have a drink of water. Go right ahead. All right, Charlie. Yeah. You're now in England. Uh, when was this, and what was your rank? I was still a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. uh, I was promised to be a first lieutenant just as soon as I I uh, got to my outfit, but uh, the next thing that happened, of course, was uh, our uh, trip from Southampton over to La Havre. Uh, was this still like 1943? Oh, let me think. No, that would have been for Now, no, no, no. Uh, the uh, the invasion was in '44, mm -hmm. and this would have been uh, in late uh, forty eight forty four. Uh, all right. There were thirty of us as re in that group of replacement artillery spotter pilots. And uh, so we spent uh, uh, one or two days, uh, probably only one, one night and one day, in, uh, in, a, in a cigarette camp above uh, La Havre. And then they trucked us from there directly over to uh, Ep Epinal, France. And where is that? That's uh, in the foothills of the uh, Vosges Mountains. Oh. It's uh, in the... That would be the southeast section of France. Okay, so this is late 1944. Yes. Correct. And so the invasion has already taken place. Oh yes. The Allies are moving through France. Yes. And you're moving along with them. Well, you see, they were taking a lot of uh, casualties of the pilots. That's that's why they needed to rush us over there. And uh, they, they told me that I didn't, couldn't unpack my goods and sleep there that night because the sergeant had been waiting for me for over a week. And uh, so when I got in the Jeep with him and headed on the way to the front and where uh, they were located, uh, he told me they had lost both planes and both pilots. Wow. And so we ended up uh, about, uh, I think, uh, the Saar Valley was, uh, and the Saar was one of the rivers. There was two of them that came together. The Saar was one, and I can't remember the other, but that was the front line right there. And uh, this group uh, that I was with uh, uh, were in a, a German house with a German family. There was a father and a mother. They were elderly, and they had two little daughters. And we, they had given us the top floor. There was uh, my, uh, my mechanic, and he had two helpers. And there was uh, two observers that would have been there with me. You want me to stop or what? Well, the first thing we did then, the next morning, once I got there, uh, the, uh, the sergeant drove me up 
uh, to uh, the uh, operations office uh, where they were encamped closer to the front. And uh, they uh, gave me all the instru instructions that I needed uh, where uh, the enemy was, uh, where the uh, checkpoints were. Uh, we fired using checkpoints in the, in the area of, of uh, where the enemy was that we were going to find the targets we wanted to shoot at. And uh, they were uh, all numbered and, and, and lettered. So they were notified, and every time we moved forward, they would have more uh, maps that would be able to designate so that when we started to shoot uh, guns, uh, we would uh, be able to take how many uh, yards or, or distance uh, from uh, uh, over or under these checkpoints. And that's how we found out to start with one gun to fire until we hit onto our target and then call for fire for effect. Uh, so they gave me all the information and I went back and uh, then uh, there was a major in charge of uh, all, there were 12 planes for a division mm -hmm. and there was a major in charge of the air section and uh, every day you had a time that you were going to fly a mission and you had uh, two or three or sometimes four missions a day depending on how long you were supposed to be up about an hour at the front. And the first mission was a very interesting one because uh, I found out <laughs> a whole lot about the Germans and about how good they were. They had told me that from this place north and this place south, uh, that was our front that we were to take care of. So I started flying back and forth uh, I found you didn't go very far before you had to start dodging fire uh, 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 bullets. They would be, uh, they shoot uh, ak ak at us, they'd shoot the larger stuff. Then they even shot uh, that uh, famous gun that they had, which was the best one of all guns, and that was the German 88. And I mean, that thing, when it goes off and when it breaks and the shell open and sprays the area uh, with uh, shrapnel, uh, that's very effective, very uh, interesting because it has a, a, a huge red-orange uh, center as it breaks and then turns into a black uh, spot and cloud and smoke and they would fire them in volleys at you. Now what I also found out was that in the middle of that sector there was a farm down there that uh, they had told me was named the Bellevue Farm, and it was quite a big one. The Germans had zeroed in on that farm, and they had somebody at the front, uh, so that when our planes were going to fly over it, all that uh, German had to do was estimate our height, and they already knew how to break shells into that area, but uh, they had to have the height approximate. So they were very close, and uh, many, many times I could have gotten, uh, the shells were so close under the plane, over, uh, you could hear them go by. Uh, but I didn't worry about it, I just made sure that I was going up and down and <laughs> like a snake and, and trying to make sure that they didn't have a good easy shot to, uh, you know, shoot ahead of me. Uh, while well, my uh, poor observer is back there calling in uh, uh, anything that he could see that, was, uh, that we needed to shoot at. Now the targets that we would shoot at, the most uh, uh, one that we'd see the most would be their artillery uh, locations because they would spit fire. You could see the red splash, you could see the smoke and things, so they gave themselves away and so we would fire on them. The tanks, if we saw any tanks, we, we fired on tanks and they would shoot with armored piercing, um, uh, you know, uh, bullets or uh, shells, uh, tanks. Oh, and then uh, when they brought up uh, troops from behind, uh, they usually tried to come up through draws or hidden by uh, things and uh, if we spotted them we would call that in and then the shells would be set for proximity shells that would go off above them 
uh, you know, they would sense uh, above the ground how high and spray them with uh, fragments. Uh, any other uh, things that we saw that was uh, uh, vital to shoot at, uh, we would uh, call a target in and shoot at it. Uh, so uh, we had a good chance. We were flying about 800 to 1,000 feet above them, and uh, they would shoot everything they had at you, and they would also send Messerschmitts fighter planes up in pairs. They would send two. One would be high and another would be low, and the one that was high told the low one where we were and how to get there and so forth. They directed, and the, you never saw the low one, and that's the one that would shoot you down. You're in the middle of a Messerschmitt sandwich. That's right. So anyway, that's what I experienced on my first mission, and I want to tell you, one hour goes awfully slow. I never thought about that, to uh, be honest with you. I, a couple of times they wanted me up to, on special missions, you know, uh, they would to stay longer and fire more, and, and I would have to say, gee, I'm just about out of gas, I've got to go back. Uh, we could stay up for quite a while, well, this is an hour, we could stay up. Uh, so I would say that uh, we had enough gas to stay up for an hour and a half uh, or a little more. Oh, no, we weren't that far behind the lines, you oh, mean. Right. Oh, no. Actually, uh, I didn't have that in my notes that I gave when I talked. But there was one time we were uh, close enough. Uh, that was a very bad day uh, that day because we had, oh, yeah, I did tell about that day. Uh, they were firing so much at us, the sky was full of these little white popcorn things. That was the ak, -AK they were firing, and it was just full of it. And uh, uh, that night, we had dug foxholes, uh, or slit trenches, and, uh, and so you didn't get hardly any sleep that night, because we could hear the gun that fired that shot from Germany, or, you know, the German side of the line, and we could hear the shell in the air, and we could feel, hear it explode, near, and it was quite near us. They, they, for somehow, they, they had almost zeroed in on us, but not good enough to knock any of us out, but enough so every once in a while uh, your leg would come out of that sleeping bag and you get ready to run or something. Uh, and that one, we had, <coughs> we had a, a pilot sent back to help me fly. And uh, <clears throat> after he was up for a half an hour, he came down crying and he wouldn't go up again. And that night while we were listening, he was in, in, his, uh, in his sleeping bag. Now he was a big uh, husky guy. He looked like he could have been a year old football player in the college. He was a nice looking guy. He was, he was gone, his nerves were gone. So he had to be sent back home. Uh, and I had to, to continue going up the rest, of the, the rest of the time that I was assigned to fly alone. What were your feelings at the time? Were you scared? No, you, uh, yeah. well, you were apprehensive when you're up in there and they're breaking around you. But on the other hand, you had a job to do. And uh, uh, that's all you were thinking about was doing the right job and hoping that your observer was going to be able to put some artillery on these people. Okay. Now, of course, you're being shot at. Yeah. Were you ever wounded? No. I come very close a number of times. My sergeant would always check my plane. I think one time I could have lost my left leg, <coughs> uh, the, the shell gun, it was probably uh, probably an ak, -AK. <clears throat> It went through and below my left foot because of the holes and everything. And the pedal was for my rudder pedal. Uh -huh. 
and went out the cowling, but it didn't even, you know, it could have ruined the engine, but it didn't. Wow. Uh, that's the closest I came, but on the other hand, the poor planes uh, that I had, uh, they, 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 they took quite a beating. Uh-huh. How many planes did you go through? <laughs> Ah, uh, I, I, that way I, I didn't have any of them that went, uh, you know, were out uh, that I, we lost because of uh, air fire. Amazing. I was lucky. You were very lucky. Um, as far as uniform was concerned, uh, when you were flying, were you wearing, uh, like, the leather or... Nope. We were not wearing any protective uh, things at all. Uh, we were wearing those leather hats that came down. Uh, we had uh, basically cloth uh, uniforms that we were wearing. And we started, uh, they wanted us to take the 45 ki- uh, pistol out, oh, that, you know, a big heavy thing. And if they ever hit anything, well, it would blow a hell of a hole. But you couldn't, you couldn't aim the darn thing. It had such a buck, and uh, it was very heavy. So we stopped carrying those, mm-hmm. and no parachutes. No parachutes. Well, we weren't up that high. Sometimes we might get up to three thousand feet if we, <clears throat> we had to for certain purposes. But <clears throat> basically, we were lower. <coughs> now, Charlie, uh, how many missions did you fly overall? Overall? Yeah. I never counted them. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. No, no, when I went home, uh, you see, we have, uh, all the pilots have a flight book. Uh-huh. And you have to record every single flight that you make in that flight book. And uh, unfortunately, I had it for many years after the war, and then all of a sudden, in all the movements that we made, oh, it no. disappeared, and I don't know where it went. And I, I really wish, because I made notes, of course, mm-hmm. which we weren't supposed to do. Yeah. I made notes in it. Uh, but I, I remember an article in our local paper that interviewed me, and I had, at that time, in the flight book, 120 missions. Oh, yes. Did you ever have time off? Ah, yes. Ah, yes. That's a good question. The first time, uh, I don't know, I'd been there uh, doing missions uh, for at least a couple of months, I can't remember. And uh, the major said to me, Charlie, you're due for your uh, R&R. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we've got a place in Grenoble, France. Now, you know where Grenoble, France yes. is? Okay. Mm-hmm. It's right at the foot of the uh, Alpe d'Huez. That's the name of the. And so uh, my sergeant and I, and a peep, we tried to go over the Brenner Pass because that would have been the shorter way to go down and then the, up the Riviera and then around. Uh, uh, but we got up to the Brenner Pass and they wouldn't let us through because at that time, uh, no, wait a minute, that was the second time I went. Ah, that was the second time okay. because the war was over at that time. Right. Uh, it had just, got, just gotten over. Uh, so but scratch that. Mm-hmm. Uh, this time we had to go around Lake Constance mm-hmm. and Switzerland and a swing around the mountains, the, the French Alps, and down to Grenoble. And so I thought, gee whiz, this is really nice of them, you know, giving it. But on the other hand, and, and so, I, but the second time I went, I knew why. Oh. <laughs> you had to get a certain amount of tenseness, I suppose. Of course, I was stupid and young, so I. <laughs> But anyway, uh, yes, that was very nice of them. And they had it set up 
we uh, would have a room for a week down there at uh, the hotel in Grenoble. It was the Internationale. And, uh, but on the other hand, I, I was told that if we want to drive up the mountain, Alp d'Huez, up above two cloud level, there was a wealthy uh, chalet up there, the Le Trois Dolphins. And uh, so uh, I said, come on, and away we went. We drove, you have to go you know, back and forth and up. Mm -hmm. Through, uh, when you get up there, of course, you're in bright, brilliant sunlight and warm. And so we, we did some skiing up there. And it was very nice. And the chalet was, had good food and everything. Uh, that was great. And uh, so, but when the next one came, no, many months later, uh, I, I, I was ready for it. Now, let me see, uh, you ask about the relief, and I said, so I told you. Right. Um, how did you keep track of news from other fronts in the war? Did you have a radio? Were there, was there stars and stripes? We, we had, uh, if we had, I didn't think about it. I didn't use it. Uh, my mind constantly would be on what I was doing, and and uh, making sure that I did everything the right way. And so constantly, you have to be thinking about uh, what you're going to do next. And, uh, and every, everything falls in place. And, and mm -hmm. so you, you, have, you have to keep thinking ahead. Right. So Charlie, is there any particular mission that stands out in your mind? <laughs> well, I gave them about 12 uh, ones. Uh, you would want to, not like to have me tell you about one or two? Go right ahead. Well, one that uh, it, it was, uh, as I say, we were in, uh, in the 44th Infantry Division and we were on uh, in the 7th uh, Army. I forget who the general was in charge of it. That's not important. But on, uh, we were on the left side of that 7th Army, and on the right side of the 3rd Army was Patton. And, he, and so one time, I'm sure I, I flew over my old outfit, the 4th Armored Division, because uh, we went, uh, for, for some reason, we kept going looking for targets well behind the German lines. Mm -hmm. uh, we would do that every once in a while looking for targets. And uh, all of a sudden, we came across this hell of a great uh, tank battle at a little village, like a crossroads type of thing. And uh, each side was shooting the devil out of the other and firing those tanks, something terrible. And we sat up there, me and my observer's name was Kelly. He was from Oklahoma City. And a nice Irish guy, he was a nice f f fellow, I liked him. And uh, so we were watching uh, the, the battle down there. We hadn't been there very long, of course. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, there was streams of red tracer bullets that, you know, they fire them so they can, they can see where the bullets are going. And they probably were 50 caliber mm -hmm. uh, tracer bullets. And they came up and they almost uh, went through our right wing. Uh, but it was instant, there was a stream of them, uh, so I flipped that plane over uh, on the left and pushed her down uh, to go down as fast as I could and get out of there and turn and go back. And, and then when I did that, I looked back like this and there is Kelly, and I thought he was going to push his head through the side of the plane. He said, let's get out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we did. Uh, and when I got back, we got in line for uh, lunch, and a sergeant come running up and he said, I had seen that uh, there was a hole about that far behind Kelly, uh, and what I went right up, you know, through the plane, and uh, uh, a sergeant come running up and he said, you know, you got a whole lot of holes in your plane. I said, I know. And he said, well, you almost got shot, got uh, hit. 
And I said, yeah, it was Kelly. No, 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 he said, it was, it was you. And that's when he told me about the left foot. Wow. <laughs> and and uh, so the plane was pretty well riddled with some bullet holes. Uh, almost every time that you went up, you were gonna come back with some bullet holes. Uh, luckily, you didn't get any that uh, I didn't. So uh, that was that one. Uh, we could tell you about, well, uh, there's one that's easy to tell. Uh, when we crossed the Rhine, we crossed uh, right at uh, Worms and Mannheim. Those are two large uh, German cities uh, close together. and. Uh, I was about up to about 3,000 feet that time. And uh, there was an awful lot of ACAC and things going on. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, they, they started shooting uh, the German 88 that was breaking. And there were clusters of four shots that would break and uh, you know spray their uh, shots. And they were close. Uh, they really were close. And so I, again, put the plane into a steep dive. It was supposed to be redlined at 120 miles an hour, and I was going 140 miles an hour with full throttle straight down. And uh, before I got down, I headed for a huge cloud. Uh, it must have been an oil refinery that had been hit, and it had uh, blown up and was on fire and it had a huge black cloud, and so I flew to hide behind that, that big cloud. And before I got down there, uh, they uh, fired uh, two more volleys that broke around me. And it was very interesting. After the war, one of my friends that told me he was there uh, when we crossed, and when he crossed, he wasn't in my outfit, but he said he had crossed the Rhine at Mannheim too. And I told him about that, and he said, yes, he said, I saw that. <laughs> and, and that was Don Vogt. And he said he had seen the Germans trying to hit me. So that was a, a very striking thing. And I don't know, there's only one other I could tell you about, if you've got time. Go right ahead. Uh, well, as I say, I ended up flying in the Alps and the Germans uh, would not let us, their small planes fly in the Alps, and uh, for good reason. The winds are tremendous, and I'm not going to get into it. The winds, all, if they're uh, coming from the one side, will go up, and you'll go up like an elevator. But if you're in the other side, the winds are coming down, and with a little cub, even with all the power you've got, you're still going to go down. Uh, I almost, but that's another story. Anyway, uh, we were flying in there. We chased the Germans into the Inn Valley. And uh, we uh, went in all the way to Imps, which was in the Inn Valley. Uh, and, and uh, oh, if you turn left, you would have been down to Innsbruck. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, uh, we were in there, so we had uh, finished our mission and we were on the way out. What we didn't know was a blizzard on the outside of the Alps. So when we came out, we were in a blizzard, which was uh, very bad to fly in. It was not a good idea to stay up. And so I spotted a, a house down there near a field, and I, so I landed and went in and told them I were going to stay, stay there all night with them. And they were Germans, and uh, they always let you, you know, they, they, they would. Uh, so we stayed. They didn't give us any food, though. Uh, and it got dark, started to get dark. And uh, I kept going out and checking, and it, it had let up the blizzard somewhat. And so I said to the observer, come on. Uh, I don't know which one was with me now. They rotated them all the time. And uh, we went out and with our fingers, we scraped because it was more than just snow. It was ice it had to start forming. So you had to use your fingers and fingernails to scrape the wings off. So we scraped all the wings off and the elevators and the rudder. 
and everything, so uh, I w took off and uh, flew back. Now, I, we had desert, they had picked out a new landing field. That happened once because if you're going fast and moving, uh, they would have to change the field that you were going to be in. And uh, they had told me where it was, and I had flown over it, so I knew the characteristic of it. It was a uh, hundred foot pine trees all around it, and across the middle of it was power lines. Oh so you didn't have a lot of land, but you had to come down once you got over the pine trees, and then you had to get down quick to go under, uh, so you'd be on the ground when you went past the power lines. and. Uh, now, by the time we got there, it was pitch black. Absolutely, nine o'clock at night, pitch black. But here's the value of the little cub. It had many values, but it won't stall. Any plane bigger will stall, and that means that nose is going down, and you're gonna go straight down for a while before you can stop it. The, the cub will mush. So I put it in a mush stall, uh -huh. just enough power. And so it's going mush, mush, mush. After I went over the pine, the last pine tree, so I went down like an elevator. So I, I wasn't gliding in, right. I was mushing down and forward. And when, uh, now you always to land, you look out 45 degrees. You never look out over the cowling. You can't tell anything. But you look out 45 and there's snow all over the ground. And uh, finally, when I saw that we were going to be landing, I had nose high. I came down also nose high because I wanted uh, the tail wheel to hit first. And I didn't know when that was going to happen. So when we got down there and I saw the thing, then I waited until the tail wheel hit the ground. And then I pushed the the stick forward so the nose would go down and I gave it full gas, well a lot of gas and the, uh, the propeller then took us and then I uh, taxied down the middle of the field and uh, until I come to the rest of the planes that were down there tied up and I tied our plane up and I saw one of the houses there with some lights and I knew that would be the headquarters where the major was and, and the other pilots so we walked in, and the Major says, how'd you get here? I said, I flew in. He said, you, you couldn't have flown in. He said, we had a hard time in the daytime. He said, to one of the pilots, he said, go out and see if his plane's out there. So he came back, and he said, yes, Major. He said, the plane is out there. And then he shook his head, I, I don't know how you did it, he said. So uh, that was uh, pretty risky, but luckily, that little cub saved me. I could go on with a lot of, they always were shooting at me, and so, well, one time I was taken off, and uh, I happened to look up and I saw a German jet that was the first German jet that I didn't even know was up. They had, didn't even know that they, they had a jet. It was silver, and I saw him, and he turned and he started to dive to come down on me. And so I put the, plane down quick. Luckily, I was only about 50 feet up in the air. I had just taken off, and I put it right down, and I headed for a big woods in front of me, and I kept the woods between me and the jet. <clears throat> but uh, the uh, major in charge of headquarters battery said he, I had saved his life because um, he saw me do that, and he was coming down the road uh, with a jeep and uh, the driver. And he told the guy, pull over, he said, right away. And they pulled over and hopped out of the Jeep and went off the road. And that jet came down and strafed the whole road and uh, his Jeep and everything. Uh, so uh, that's another story, uh, you know. Oh, there is, you got one more? I, this one's on you. You remember what I told you about <clears throat> my captain saving my life uh, back in the States when he had, had me uh, <clears throat> switch to ride with him, mm -hmm. and we lost Lieutenant Wiseman. There was a, a, one of the pilots, and he was supposed to be a, the best pilot there. He was a big, nice-looking guy. His name was Martin, 
I don't know how they rated him, but he was supposed to be a real good pilot. And he came to me and he said, Charlie, he said, I've been taking this major up. He said he wants to try to get an air medal if he gets enough time in. <clears throat> and he said, I, uh, I, I understand you've got the Dawn Patrol. <clears throat> I said, yeah. He said, I want to trade with you. So I said, fine. So he went uh, on the Dawn Patrol, and there were two uh, Messerschmitts waiting for him. And uh, one of them, the low one, came in and riddled the plane with bullets. And uh, the, the major was completely killed with bullets, absolutely, had riddled him. Uh, the pilot uh, wasn't quite killed, but he, he had fragments all over him and bullets, uh, holes. So he was gone for the rest of the war. Uh, so I was lucky there. He crash, land, he crash landed, and a, a German farmer was nice enough to take him to the nearest uh, uh, U.S. Army uh, group that was near there. But I was lucky again. Mm. Very lucky. So anyway, that'll be enough to hold you. All right. Well, let's head to the end of the war. Uh, where were you stationed when BE Day was declared? Well, that involves, the, I started to tell you a little about the Alps. Mm -hmm. I had, was, uh, me and my observer were flying in the Alps. We flew down in through the valleys. Our little cub could not go up to the top of the Alps. <laughs> we would be out of gasoline by the time we get up there. But anyway, uh, we went in uh, the valley and we came to uh, Imps, as I told you was in the Inn Valley, and we turned right at Imps and went up the Inn Valley to, uh, headed for a little town called uh, Fusen. Mm -hmm. I believe that was the name. There were three of those that had a similar type name, but I think this was Fusen, a little town. And as I had turned right to go up there, I, I ran right into a downstream over the mountains, uh -huh. over the, uh, yeah. And so I started to go down. Now I was probably about 1,500 feet up when I started, but it kept going. I could not s s change it. And it was a very narrow valley, and I, I didn't feel I had room to turn around. And so I, I just kept sweating it out, going down, hoping I could, you know, come back up and get out of there, or that I would come to a place to turn around. Well, I came to this little town of Houston, and I knew the Germans had that town. So I had to turn around at about 600 feet, or maybe 700. It was very low. And I had to turn around over that little town, and I was expecting gunfire all the time because they could have shot in small arms, anything. Never a shot. What I found out when I got back was that was the day the war was being, the armistice was being signed in that section. <laughs> and, and then, so that was sa saved me that day because they would have made mincemeat of me if the Germans were still fighting. Life. I thank the Lord every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that'll take care of the. Okay. Now Charlie, when the war ended, what was your rank? Oh, now that's a good one. You remember this guy I saved his life? Yes. Well, when I got there and was assigned to it, I went to the captain and I said, they told me that when I got here and was uh, but I had enough time put in, uh, in all ways, in flying time and every time, to be uh, uh, raised to a first lieutenant. And he said, Charlie, he said, the other pilot was one of those sergeant pilots that had failed in the Air Corps. That's where they started to use them. They, they failed when they went to the multi-engines or the fighter planes, but they knew how to fly by the small planes. And he said, I had to, uh, I had to give uh, Brian, his name was Brian, I had to give him his first, his second lieutenant bars. Mm -hmm. 
So he said, you'll have to wait until he gets his first lieutenants because he's been here. Uh, no, wait a minute. I said when I went, they, so, oh, he came in, in that group, uh, I guess, uh, ahead of me. But he came as a replacement also, but he was a sergeant. That was the difference. So the son of a bee, he shouldn't have let that happen. I was an officer for a year and a half, and I had flown. Uh, but anyway, uh, boy, I hated him. And he's the one I saved his life. Uh, so I had to wait until he got uh, his first lieutenant before he could give, would give me mine. So I came home as a first lieutenant, and uh, by that time I said I could care less. I was going home. Uh, actually, I could have, if I wanted to stay in, I could have been made a captain right away. Uh, so that's the story. So Charlie, uh, when the war ended, were you still in France, Germany? Oh, there's another story there, but it's not as frightening. It's just a little. Go ahead. Uh, when the war was over, mm -hmm. uh, shortly after that flight, I told you, you know, yeah. they announced. I saw on the bulletin board uh, where we were stationed, and uh, we were, uh, you know, on the ground. We didn't have any barracks or anything, and we probably uh, see that would have been would have been a little south of Munich. Mm -hmm. That's where we were when the war was over, you know, our temporary f f field. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I saw this notice. It, it said anybody, any pilots, uh, that uh, you know, artillery pilots that want to uh, fly, want to fly for the Third Corps, uh, they were inviting it. And so I did with open arms. I didn't want to be around that damn captain or major anymore uh, you know and no flying and all that stuff right. uh, I couldn't stand looking at them and so I flew I went to the which was uh, on the outskirts of Innsbruck mm -hmm. and uh, now they were flying a, a, a bigger and faster planes it, to a certain extent uh, the the Stinson I don't know whether you know what that was the L5 and that could cruise be the cruising speed was 125 to 140 miles an hour mm -hmm. and had big flaps on it, one wing, uh, big flaps. And uh, that was, uh, that was uh, they were using these for courier service. Uh, we flew back and forth to Munich, uh, uh, to uh, Nancy, France, and different big cities like that, taking generals and high-ranking ones back and forth. And uh, we flew out of uh, Innsbruck, Austria. Oh, they, and, but I did get a chance to fly a German plane. It was a low-wing uh, predecessor of the Messerschmitt. It was one they used as a trainer. And now that thing would go, uh, I didn't go almost 200 miles an hour. I was between 150 and 200, somewhere in there. That was a fast little plane. It had tiny little little uh, tires, and it was a land-loving son of a gun. We had to fly off of uh, engineers put down uh, a temporary field, landing field, landing, and they used uh, the steel. Uh, they're like they're links. Well, to get one of those devils off the ground, you had to get it off from only on one wheel, you had to get it, and then yank it off. It didn't want to come off, you see. And so uh, I, I, was, uh, I had plenty of time because the wind was coming from, let's say, the left. And so that was all right. I could go quite a ways. But the last flight I had out of there, the wind had changed just a hundred and, what is 180, right around. Right. So now I have to go the other way. And I'm heading towards Innsbruck and the buildings, the tall buildings. And uh, it didn't want to come off. And here I am. So I finally had to get it over on one wheel and then yank it. 
At the last minute, I went up and I couldn't go over the buildings. So I put the wing down. I put the wing down, uh, and then I, I, I climbed as fast, fast I could uh, with that wing down, so I wouldn't hit any of the buildings until I got over Innsbruck and got out of there. And I really sweat that one. But uh, <laughs> that's the end. <laughs> okay. Were you discharged? Oh, all right. That was easy. Uh, we came home on the largest ship in the world that was the Queen Mary, uh, Queen Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were the first uh, uh, division to come home all on one ship. That was because our general, General Dean, had gone to Eisenhower and said, my boys want to go uh, to, to be in the invasion of Japan. We didn't tell them to say that. <laughs> and so uh, they, they sent us home. We were the first one. And, uh, and so we landed, and then uh, we were uh, uh, trucked to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. And that's where we were uh, given a, I think we were given a, a two-week vacation. Uh, and then we were assigned to uh, go from there to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas to learn how to fly in the, the jungles of the, uh, and the terrains down mm -hmm. on the invasion for Japan. And of course, while we were on vacation at uh, that time, uh, the war in Japan was over. Okay. Uh, what did you think when you heard about the atomic bomb dropping? Uh, well, I would assume that uh, we felt the way everybody else did. Uh, we didn't have any pity or, uh, for the Japanese at all. Uh, I mean, uh, the, this was uh, the right thing to do to save a whole lot of uh, people, uh, uh, soldiers on both sides of the uh, uh, of uh, the, the contestants. Uh, it was the right thing to end it, and uh, and it was ended. And. Uh, too bad that a whole lot of Japanese people had to be, had to die, but after all, they they started it and they bought they bought it. Mm -hmm. All right. So you were in Arkansas when the war ended. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, were you sent back to New York to be discharged, or were you discharged um, out in uh, Arkansas? I'm a little confused of that, uh, Maureen. Uh, I believe they sent us back to Fort Dix. Yes, I know they, that's where we come. They sent us back because that was all set up. It made you know all kinds of sense. Arkansas wasn't set up to discharge. So you were sent to Fort Dix, and when were you discharged? That was the very end of July. 1945. Okay, Charlie, what happened after that? Well, uh, my wife uh, was uh, living uh, with uh, her parents, mm -hmm. and uh, so I went uh, uh, to uh, live with the parents also. And that was our home for a while until we uh, found a, an apartment to rent, which we did. And where was this? In Geneva, New York. Now, Charlie, did you um, take advantage of the GI Bill for any further education? Yes, not education. Uh, they also had a thing that... Uh, uh, you could ha get a job with somebody, and uh, then uh, the government would pay you fifty dollars uh, a week uh, as a, as a salary. How did this work? Now wait a minute. And uh, now my father had this insurance agency, mm -hmm. and so I uh, I worked for him and sold insurance. And uh, oh, it was just for a short time that the government paid the 50 and then he had to pay me $50. Okay. 
and I was earning more than that. I was selling insurance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I was an artist, of course, and I, I uh, went and uh, went to Rochester and, and I be got a art jobs and from then on I was a commercial artist. Now you have uh, that lovely collection of medals and commendations. Why don't you pick that up and tell us a little bit about some of the medals that you have. Ooh. Well, of course, the one I'm, I'm very proud of is the fact that I've got a, uh, uh, the equivalent of three air medals. This is the air medal, and it's got uh, two little um, bronze uh, oak leaves on it. That means I had three uh, air medals awarded to me. Uh, that was the OCS uh, thing. The, this was the 44th. Now let me see. Well, he got the, the Good Conduct Medal. Uh, yeah, I have to point to him. Yeah, well, a good contact medal, and uh, then there's uh, one for our, the Army uh, of Occupation uh, of Europe, uh, a Victory Medal, uh, European Campaign Medal, yeah. with two battle stars, mm -hmm. and uh, the Overseas Ribbon, oh, well, the rest of them are just uh, designations of the outfits that I was in. <laughs> okay. Now, Charlie, after the war, did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, yes, I did. I joined the American Legion in our hometown. And I've been a, a, a member of it for almost 70 years. The last time, I believe it was about 69, or 68, 69 years, a uh, continuous member of, and I'm still a member of our local, <coughs> pardon me, Geneva <coughs> American Legion. Okay. And uh, let's see. Were you always in New York? After the war, or did you? Oh, no. Oh, no, wait a minute. No, I wasn't. Uh, at one time, I uh, went to Chicago because my uh, sister-in-law and my brother-in-law mm -hmm. were living in uh, Chicago, and he wanted me to come out uh, and look for a job, and I went out on a weekend and got a job right away. Uh, in an art studio, and I was there for six months. Uh, my wife came out, looked for a house, and decided she didn't want to go to Chicago. And so uh, I quit my job and uh, went back to Geneva and started my own business as a commercial artist. And when did you move to Chicago? Was that in 1960? That was October 1st, uh, 2004. And why did you move to Massachusetts? Because we had, wait a minute, we had four children that lived uh, in the area of, around uh, of Marlboro. Okay. Now did any of your children Enter the military. Yes, my oldest son uh, was Charles, mm -hmm. and uh, we called him Chuck uh, for the difference. Uh, he joined the. Uh, he didn't like college. Uh, he tried the first year as a freshman, and he come back and he said, "Dad," he said, "I want to join the uh, the Air Force," and so he joined uh, the uh, the uh, Air Force. Uh, and uh, served uh, 
his uh, time in the Air Force. Okay. Any other uh, children? Uh, yes, I had a daughter and I had uh, three other boys. <coughs> Pardon me. But uh, none of the boys, uh, or nor my daughter, uh, were in any service. They were younger. Mm -hmm. How about your grandchildren? They didn't serve in the <laughs> war very long. <laughs> well, uh, no, they had. Uh, my, oh, well, my son, my grandson is now. Uh, I think he's about uh, thirty-eight years old. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a great uh, pitcher uh, at his college, and for three years after that, he uh, was a great uh, baseball pitcher in the minor leagues, uh, but that's it. Okay. Charlie, uh, we're just about ready to wrap up this interview. Are there, is there any other stories or any other reflections about your life in the military? <laughs> Brian's laughing and I'm laughing because I'm full of stories. <laughs> I have a great memory, I really do, and uh, and so uh, there's many, many things, I suppose. Okay, let's redirect that. Uh, how important was it for you to serve in the military? That's a good question. Uh, that's a very good question. I never had it asked me before. How important? It was very important to me. I had to do it. I wanted to do it. I couldn't wait to get in. Uh, that's just like playing a sport. Mm -hmm. Hurry up, coach, and put me in. <laughs> so yes, I was glad to get in. And as I told so many people, what I did was very, very dangerous, but I was too young and too stupid. <laughs> You were just very, very lucky. Yes, I was. Uh, Charles Rogers, incredible story. Thank you so much for coming to the Museum of World War II Boston and taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Can I thank you for all of the soldiers and uh, boys that served and girls and women for this museum which is keeping memories alive that should never be forgotten. And I certainly want everybody to remember the artillery pilots of World War II, because up till now, I know of no place that ever told the story. <laughs>